Bula Binaka and a warm best greeting to everyone who is listening in today. Welcome to this fourth webinar for Pride Month, uh, an initiative of the U.S. Embassy Youth Council in partnership with the U.S. Embassy in Suva. Some of you joined us for the first three webinars that happened the last three weeks for Pride Month. Uh, the first week we had Rhonda, Maria Nailebu and Krishnir Sen talking to us about the, the history of the LGBT movement in Fiji and the Pacific. Uh, the second week, we had uh, Joey Mataele from Tonga Ladies Association talking about COVID-19, mental health, and the LGBT community. The third week, we had uh, Dr. Joseph Takai from the Tonga Ladies Association who talked to us about um, health in general with the LGBT community. And this week, we have got Miles Young, Miki Wali, and Iskele Pulovo, who is going to talk, who are going to talk about uh, laws and policies in the region with regards to the LGBT community, how the, we can work uh, together in lobbying, uh, being strategic in our work to advance the human rights agenda for the LGBT community. Um, first off, uh, just keep in mind that this uh, webinar is going to be recorded to be put on YouTube later. And uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to send it to us in the chat box, either myself or Tele. You can see our accounts and we'll pose it for you. And if you feel that you want to pose those questions ourselves, put, put that down in a question and we'll give you a chance. Before we start, I would like to invite Venus Reyes from the US Embassy, who is, I think, deputy head or acting head of the public diplomacy section to give a welcome to our panelists and everybody who has joined us on this call. Venus. Bula Vinaka, everyone. Thank you very much. I would like to extend a warm welcome to all joining us tonight for our final Kailanoa session celebrating Pride Month with the EYC, the Embassy Youth Council. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our guest speakers for generously, generously giving them their time over the weekend to share their expertise, expertise on regional and national human rights um, framework in the Pacific and the work that they do with the LGBTQI community. Tonight, we are honored to have Miles Young, Director of the Human Rights and Social Development Division at SPC, as well as Esekeli, uh, Bulabao of the Pacific Sexual, Sexual and Gender Diversity Network and Mickey of the House of Chameleon. I'd also like to acknowledge our previous speakers from the LGBTQI community here in Fiji and Tonga for, for participating in our last three sessions. And a big thank you to the EYC, particularly I, Abdul and Abikash for putting together this initiative to celebrate Pride Month despite the current COVID-19 restrictions. LGBTQI communities in the US Embassy uh, Suva five accredited countries. It's also a space that has provided an opportunity for open dialogue among young people and has given tools on how to become an aware ally. So tonight, I wish you all a wonderful and engaging session. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Venus, uh, for that welcome. And yes, this would be our last webinar for this month for, uh, for this series, but I'm sure we'll have opportunity to have uh, more discussions around uh, this topic, which is very important uh, to ensure that no one is left behind. Uh, I'm going to go straight into the questioning, uh, sorry, into the Talanoa, not questioning, but I'll have questions. Uh, as I usually do, I'm going to start with Miles. So the first question as usual is, if Miles could introduce himself, the work that he does, pronounce that he would like us to use for him. And you can see I'm already using pronouns because we had the free call with uh, our panelists. Uh, so yeah, Miles. Uh, Vinaka Abdul, and uh, thank you much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Venus, for those uh, welcoming words. As Abdul mentioned, my name is Miles Young. Uh, I'm the director of the Human Rights and Social Development Division, HRSD, of the Pacific Community. So the Pacific Community, as uh, some of you will know, is um, it's an intergovernmental organization, and uh, it uh, is headquartered in 
uh, Numeri, New Caledonia, but we have a large campus here in Suverin, Fiji. It's an intergovernmental organization um, in that it is an organization which was established by way of a treaty, by way of an international agreement. And we have 26 uh, countries and territories who are members of SBC, including 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. And on top of that, we have the United States um, as a member, Australia, New Zealand, and France. And those four countries we consider to be metropolitan members. So 26 countries and territories, including 22 Pacific Island countries and territories. What does SBC do? I mean, SBC is a technical organization. We provide technical assistance and capacity building to our members. Uh, my division supports our members in the area of human rights, gender equality, um, culture, and as well as uh, youth. So those are the areas of work that we support our members in. Um, but SBC has a, a range of divisions. We cut across around 20 sectors, including in fisheries, in education, in public health, land resources, a whole range of different areas. Uh, but as I said, my division, Human Rights and Social Development, works in, in that particular space, Human Rights and Social Development. So hopefully that just gives you a, a flavor of, um, of what I do and what my division does and what SBC does. So Abdul, with that introduction, do you want me to, sorry, you're going to introduce Isikeli and, uh, and Miki as well, aren't you, before I move on? Yeah. But I'd, I'll have one follow-up question. Uh, one follow-up question after introduction, and my follow-up question to you would be: So, before the division you were heading was called the Triple RT, if I'm not wrong, Regional Rights Resource Team. Now it's uh, Human Rights and Social Development. Just maybe a quick brief on uh, what the name change means and how do the LGBT movement uh, fit in into the division explicitly? Okay. Th thank you very much. Yes, so we are called Human Rights and Social Development now, and that name change only came about in September last year, and it came about because there was a merger of two divisions of the Regional Rights Resource Team, or RRRT, and RRRT was the division that I headed previously, and uh, the work program for RRRT was purely human rights. Um, in addition to RRRT, we had within SBC another division, called Social Development Program. And that division had the mandate or responsibility for gender equality, for youth, and for culture. And because there was a, an overlap between our responsibilities, you know, gender equality and human rights, there's overlap, obviously. The organization, um, as a result of feedback from our members, decided to merge the two divisions. So the two divisions merged in September, October last year to form the Human Rights and Social Development Program. So as I said earlier, that division or this division has the mandate for human rights, for gender equality, for youth and for culture. So it merged the responsibilities of these two divisions. So the work that um, we do does cover um, work in support of uh, LGBTQI plus issues. So I hope I hope that explains the name change and the uh, and the expanded mandate of this division. That's good enough. Um, is Isikeli still with us on the call? Uh, Isikeli seems to have dropped out. He will join back in. So I'll go to Mickey. Mickey, the same question to you. Uh, introduction, pronouns, the work that you do. Uh, go. Okay, Bolivinaka, Salam Alaikum. It's so good to be on this platform. Um, hi, hi, Miles, and also to um, Isti Kelly. I hope you both are well. Um, it's good to have you both on this call. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, good afternoon, good morning, wherever, whichever time zone you're joining in from. Um, so I'm Miki, and I direct the House of Chameleon at this point in time. I also am a board of director of the Pacific Sexuality Gender Diversity Network and the alternate co-chair for the ILGA, which is the International Lesbian Gay Association in Oceania. Um, and I also share diverse capacities of leadership, um, as well with the Asia Pacific Transgender Network and a couple of other capacities as well. I wanna say that um, for this call, 
in this particular Palanoa, I will be sharing different um, key uh, perspectives from the various capacities I share. So no particular order, I would say, Abdul. Um, but I also would like to feed off from where both Miles and um, Issa Kelly will be providing um, key recommendations and perspectives as well. So thank you. It's great because I will have no particular order to my questions. There's so many questions to ask. So I'll probably be jumping from one topic to the other based on the set of questions I have and the audiences. So just a follow-up question, Sneaky. You're part of the House of Chameleon. Uh, and uh, you're also part of Ilga Oceania. Do you want to just highlight the work that the House of Chameleon does in Fiji and what does Ilga Oceania do and stand for? So with the House of Chameleon as director, thank you, Abdul. Our work is pretty much on transgender equality and recently we've expanded to include trans masculine, so trans men, and also gender non-conforming or gender diverse people. And so our work is focused specifically around um, the, the identities that I've mentioned. Um, that doesn't limit us. That doesn't limit us only to trans and GNC folks. Our work also stands in solidarity with the other identities, whether you're LB, Q and I. And we do have um, programs and projects that we have partnership with. For instance, with the Rainbow Pride Foundation to the Nassau Bilateral. Um, we also have uh, the Rainbow Fiji Coalition, which we're also party to, and also the Fiji Sex Workers Alliance Network, which we also share support and solidarity with. Um, and our work is predominantly on trans equality. So trans health, the, the overall key pr primary pr priority of the organization is on legislative policy reform for trans and gender non-conforming people. And so there are projects that are on this, uh, that particular um, project that specifically targets um, lawmakers and policymakers such as the Fiji Police Force, um, engaging with policymakers at the parliamentary level, um, training of lawyers, etc. And so we do that work um, on a very minimal. Um, later this year, the, next, the, the goal was to expand it, but at this point in time, due to COVID, everything's pretty much virtual, but that, that also means that um, it gives us a bit of more understanding in terms of trajectory and where we're going, etc. Um, we also do work around trans health, uh, particularly for those that are accessing hormonal um, reassignment treatment and therapy, ensuring that, you know, there are guidelines in place, etc. So there's a couple of things um, that we do as an organization. We also do have a methodology which is very organic um, that allows us the flexibility to move around um, our various intersectional issues. Um, and so we are a trans queer feminist movement. Um, at the same time, our approach is very much intersectional. We believe also in an interlinkage analysis. Um, and also, uh, we, are, we are there particularly for human rights defenders in terms of um, uh, def trying to defend the protectionary pers um, particular perspective. I'll stop there now, Abdul. Thank you, Miki. Yeah, no problem. We'll, we'll have more chance to expand on this. Um, uh, we don't have Isikeli highlighted, but Isikeli is on the call. So while uh, the logistics team is highlighting Isikeli Bulovo, I will ask Isikeli if uh, they can unmute themselves and introduce uh, who Isikeli is and where they work. Good evening, everyone, and Bula from Fitch. I am Isikeli Bulovo, otherwise um, commonly known within the professional uh, network and also within the LGBTQ network as IV which are my initials, and my pronouns are they, there, see, here. Um, I'm currently the head of the Pacific Sexual and Gender Diversity Network, which is the regional network of LGBTQI organizations and individual activists uh, in the Pacific. And uh, we're currently based here in Suba. We were formed way back in 2007 in Samoa, but even before that, the conceptualization for the establishment of a regional network of LGBTQI organizations uh, started in Sydney in 2002 at the Gay Games, where we had uh, delegations from Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, I think Cook Islands and PNG uh, attended. And it was the first time they met up and uh, the idea to start a regional network uh, was uh, born on that day. So it took some time for it uh, to develop up until 2007, when it found its home in Samoa, at that time, Kenwala, 
who was the very first chairperson for uh, the network, was also the chief executive officer for the Samoan AIDS uh, Foundation. Uh, so the secretariat was based within um, his organization at that time. And in 2009, it was technically uh, registered under the Samoan Ministry of um, Cooperatives. So it was based at the secretariat and uh, there was a lot of funds. We were practically swimming in a lot of funds at that time uh, on HIV from Global Fund, from the Pacific Response Fund, which was brand, uh, managed by SBC. Um, and the donors were the Australian government and New Zealand government. Um, HIV was at the top uh, at that time. And um, there wasn't any regional network at that time. So UNAIDS was working very closely with these uh, founders. Um, Ms. Joey, Julie Matele, who I would like to acknowledge, Ken Moala from Sawa. Joey, of course, is from Tonga. And I think from PG, we had. Um, uh, Carlos Pereira, who were the founders of the regional network for uh, Pacific uh, LGBTQI people. And uh, we received some funding at that time uh, and received support from UNAIDS, UNDP, uh, from the Australian Federation of AIDS, and from ACOM, uh, based in Bangkok, which is the Asia Pacific Coalition on Male Sexual Health. And uh, we received a core funding at uh, from HIVOS, which is a Dutch, I uh, think, HIV service and also um, international organization. Up until 2013, when Ms. Jolene <coughs> Mataele was elected to be the chair lady, so the secretary was moved to Tonga and was uh, housed within the Tonga Ladies uh, Association. And in 2015, at a board meeting, uh, it was decided to move the secretary to Suba uh, because of many reasons, the accessibility to the donors here, to uh, SBC, to, to the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat, to other INGOs, uh, and also in recognition of the very uh, strong movement uh, here in Fiji. So we moved here in 2016, so I've been uh, volunteering as it said um, from that time 2015 to I think August 2016 when I was uh, appointed into the position and uh, have been looking after the organization ever since. So we have, um, we started off with three countries, uh, Tonga Samoa, Fiji, and then we spread our wings to the Cook Islands and PNG. And then we spread our wings further after 2015. Now we have 14 member countries. Uh, so we have American Samoa, uh, the Sophia um, Association. In Cook Islands, we have the TTR Association and recently the Pride Cook Islands. And uh, they have been partnering to move a lot of work on um, the decriminalization of homosexuality in the Cooks. Uh, and also in FSM, uh, in Fiji, we have, I think, about three or four that are currently active. We have BIMPA in Kiripas, um, and we also have a small uh, informal network in our rural. And just last year, we were able to form uh, Lahib uh, in Palau, and we have Kapul champions and Heturan City in Papua New Guinea. In the Marshall Islands, we have Brighton the Rainbow. Uh, in Samoa, we have the Samoa Pathophilia Association, the Pride Initiative, and of course, uh, My Girls. And they also have their own sort of district uh, for Pathophilia groups that uh, come under the Samoa Pathophilia Association. And in Samoa Islands, this has been a struggle. We have not been able to find uh, many activists or many members of our community who are willing to um, uh, take up the mantle of leadership and lead the movement there. So we've just been liaising with one person and we're trying to encourage, motivate and inspire her uh, to do more. In Tonga, of course, the Tonga Ladies Association, and I think they had started to form also associations within the island, the other islands in Tonga. Uh, Tuvalu, we have the, it used to be the Tuvalu Pin Association and they have evolved to become the Akanda Alliance. So they're also still struggling, trying to find their their mojo, uh, so to speak, 
to um, start something vibrant uh, in Tuvalu. And in Vanuatu, we have the Bay Pride uh, Association. And there are also ongoing efforts for us to link up with the French territories. In fact, we are already uh, connected to them. Uh, cousins, the cousins, I think, in Tahiri and uh, in New Caledonia. I'm sorry, I forgot the name of the organization, uh, but we are also connected to them. And we are also um, trying to connect to the Guam, Hawaii, uh, and other Pacific Island countries. And uh, the PhD plan, our main mission is actually um, uh, just building the movement uh, in the Pacific, finding LGBTQI people who have the passion and the drive uh, to do a work or to promote and advance the rights and well being of LGBTQI people. Um, so we have also tried to, and most of the member organizations, like in the Polynesian countries, like some of the Pina communities, they were formed well before uh, PSGDM came into existence. So they're quite well established, uh, experienced. They have a lot of expertise and the community is so heavily involved in the growth of the organization. People who are working, who have uh, white collar jobs, blue collar jobs, they are part of the association, but it's different in the Melanesian countries. We have only people um, like LGBTQ people who are unemployed or who are looking for employment or going in school that are heavily involved in uh, the movement. So we are trying to change that in the Melanesian uh, countries. And we have done researchers in the different countries with the support of UNDP, SBC, uh, and our other UN uh, partners. Um, and we have, uh, like through our national member organizations, they're working with different institutions uh, in their respective countries to try and address uh, social stigma and discrimination, and also in Fiji, we know that in Fiji, we know that uh, they're working with faith-based organizations, one of our members, uh, and we are also trying to work within the education sector. And uh, we also work uh, at different levels from grassroots, right, uh, at the grassroots level, to the district, uh, also at national, regional, and also at the international space, we've been able to make a lot of noise. And even right now, uh, one of the global organizations uh, like Ilga Oceania that Mika, Miki uh, is part of the board, uh, the, the co-secretary or the head of the Ilga world right now is uh, one of our sisters from Samoa, Samoa Papapine, um, Trisina Yemania Brown. So, there's a lot um, that has been done, but there's still a lot that needs to be done. Over to you, Abdul. Thank you, Issa Kelly, for the very comprehensive work that PSGDN does, because as you can see, I do not interrupt any of our speakers because this is an information session. These are really important information that is necessary for us as young people or people of any age to uh, you know, grasp and understand how the movement works regionally. So, um, I think Mickey wants to add on something to that. Mickey, just a quick one before we go to the first uh, question. Sure, no problem. Uh, one of the key things that um, C. Kelly had pointed out, and I think that's very important to honor um, during Pride and, uh, and across uh, Oceania, is the level of resilience um, and the journey it has been for folks in our community to spark up a revolution in, the, in, the, in Oceania. Um, to set up these organizations, to build support and solidarity. And that that's not easy at all. I mean, there, there are days when it's good, there are days when it's bad and ugly and very, very tough. And you're working with, um, you know, very heteropatriarchal systems in the Pacific, still at it. And, and I think, you know, that's the beauty of um, the fact of our gathering today is that we've come together to also pay homage and we must pay tribute to the journey of what it means to um, set up, um, you know, movements, um, whether it's PSGDN or ILGA, whether it's APTN, whether it's different organizations in their own countries, HK, RPF, HOC, Diva for Equality, Strumpet, um, SAN, I mean, TLA, SAPA, um, Tetiare, um, it's important to, to take a step back and just to think about um, the fact that 
what it, the energy that it gave um, activists across Oceania, just to speak up in the face of, you know, inhumanity, um, inequality, violence, and so many diverse kinds of um, hierarchies of oppression. And, and that today uh, we have seen progress. So I think it's very important to, to have mentioned that. And having said that, I think it's also important that along the journey, we had also lost many people, many, many people in our movement. Um, people who were young people, people who were middle-aged and people who are aging as well. So I think it's important that um, we, we take a moment to honor um, the journey of queer activism across Oceania. That's very important. Thank you yes, so much for that reminder, Yeah, sure, go ahead, Scali. If I can just add, uh, as many of these activists have been doing this work without any um, uh, compensation, like any remuneration, it's just been driven by pure passion, uh, greed, and just um, the eagerness to make a change, to be agents of change. So that has really been fueling the work, but it's not enough. And uh, we hope that, uh, you know, for us going into the future to sustain the movement, we will uh, need um, a lot more of our partners, development partners and donors to recognize the work and also start investing heavily to assist our organizing. Thank you. Thank you, Sike. Totally agree with that. Um, so just a reminder, if you have any questions, any feedback to what has been said now and what will be discussed later, please send a chat a message to me or to Talay, and we will either get you on the call or uh, ask the question for you. Indicate if you'd like to ask a question yourself. Now, the first question is, um, let's take a look at what the legal framework and policies around diversity and inclusion uh, diverse soldiers and LGBT rights looks like. Uh, the, the 2013 Constitution of Fiji, for example, has removed discrimination based on uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. But what does that mean in terms of applicability? What about the other countries in the region? How are they faring uh, in the fight you know, of human rights for LGBT, equal rights for LGBT? How about I start with Miles to provide a regional perspective and then Miki and Isikeli could provide the work that is being done towards this legislation and policies of uh, LGBT rights and equality. Miles? Yunaka Abdul. Abdul, in my uh, introduction, I spoke about myself and um, HRSD, and I didn't uh, have the opportunity to just uh, to thank the US Embassy uh, and the organizers of this seminar for giving me this opportunity to talano with you this evening. You know, any platform or forum such as this one, which gives young people the opportunity to come together to share their views and to mobilize for action is always welcomed. Um, so, so congratulations. Um, let me also, oh, congratulations and thank you for inviting me. Um, let me also commend you for selecting this topic, which we're discussing tonight, the rights of the LGBTQI plus communities in the Pacific. I mean, this is not, as Isikeli and Miki have, uh, have mentioned, this is not a subject which receives uh, sufficient attention, sufficient support, I think. And perhaps the work of the Youth Council will elevate the issue to a level um, which it deserves. And um, every opportunity should be, um, should be applauded. So, so congratulations to the Youth Council for that. Uh, before I come to your question, uh, Abdul, I just also want to say that um, we've worked, um, the Human Rights and Social Development Division at SBC, we've worked with Isikeli and PSGDN. We've also worked with uh, Mickey and House of Chameleon, and we've also worked with a number of other organizations that work in this space. And I can assure you that um, there is this passion and this commitment that um, people who work in this space bring, which I can only applaud and would invite uh, allies to join them uh, in, in their work. Our division um, as an intergovernmental organization, as part of SBC, our primary interlocutors are governments. You know, the governments of the 
26 member member states or member members of SBC. But we also work with civil society organizations and um, our, I suppose our flagship civil society program is called Pacific People Advancing Change. And this program um, supports, currently it supports um, 55 civil society organizations across eight countries. So not across the Pacific, uh, at the moment it's eight countries and the countries are Kiribati, the Federated States of Micronesia, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, Palau, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu and Vanuatu. So those are the eight countries where we support uh, a total of 55 civil society organizations. Uh, amongst the civil society organizations, we support um, a handful that work um, in the uh, in in working on LGBTIQ plus um, issues, and um, V Pride is one. I think um, Is Kelly mentioned V Pride earlier on. Um, Tonga Ladies Association is another organization we work with, um, and Tetiare was uh, is an organization in the Cook Islands. Um, that we worked with um, previously. So a handful of organizations that work in that space. And hopefully over time, we're able to expand on that program and uh, be able to add more civil society organizations that we support and also civil society organizations that work in this LGBTQI plus space. So I just wanted to mention that um, before I turn to your question. So uh, you know, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a fairly big question and, and, you know, tonight won't be, um, the time for us to go into detail. So I'm just going to provide you a very brief overview of the human rights framework. Um, and as it relates to, um, the, the issues that we're talking about today. So I think, you know, I think the the starting point for us when we talk about human rights and um, LGBTQI plus communities is the Universal Declaration, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and you know, this is um, this is a declaration which was endorsed by the General Assembly of the United Nations, and of course, in this part of the world, we have uh, twelve countries that are part of the UN. You've got Fiji, Kiribati, uh, the Marshall Islands, FSM, Nauru, Palau, uh, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, Vanuatu. So as members of the UN, um, you know, the Universal Declaration should um, be part of its DNA. You know, whether it is or not is the million dollar question, which we can have a discussion about today. But at fundamentally UDHR, um, talks about equality and non-discrimination. You know, Article 1 talks about human beings being born free and equal in dignity and rights, and Article 7 talks about um, all of us being equal before the law um, without any discrimination and, and entitled uh, without any discrimination to the equal protection of the law. So equality and non-discrimination are fundamental to the human rights framework, they're cross-cutting issues, if you like. Now, the protection of people on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity doesn't require the creation of new rights or special rights for LGBTQI plus uh, communities. Um, but rather, what it does is it, it requires enforcement of the, of the equality and non-discrimination um, principles that I just um, that I just mentioned that are embedded in the Universal Declaration, but also embedded in the um, Convention on Civil and Political Rights, um, as well as the um, as well as the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So these are the two. You know, people talk about the nine core human rights treaties, and and these are two of the of these so-called nine core human rights treaties and they're really if you like the foundation um, so you get the udhi and and after the universal declaration these other treaties are informed by what's in the udhr so 
the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. Again, if you look at this part of the world, Fiji, the Marshall Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Vanuatu, they've all um, ratified or acceded to this international treaty. And for those who are familiar with uh, international human rights, will understand that if a country um, you know, ratifies or acceded to an international treaty, such as this Convention on Civil and Political Rights, then um, they are required to give effect to that treaty nationally. So this treaty enshrines the rights of all people to non-discrimination and equality before the law. And that's in article two of the, um, of the Convention on Civil and Political Rights. And then when we come to the uh, Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, we've got Fiji, the Marshall Islands, Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands who have ratified a treat or acceded to this, this treaty. And again, Article 2 of this international convention, um, it, uh, it talks about equality and, uh, and non-discrimination. Um, of any kind as regards to race, color, sex, language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you've got the UDHR, you've got the uh, International um, Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and then you've also got the um, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So these are some foundational um, human rights instruments that really embed. There's these principles of equality and non-discrimination. And as I said, you know, while they don't um, specifically, um, while they don't specifically refer to LGBTQI plus communities, those principles of equality and non-discrimination are cross-cutting. So they apply to everyone. Um, so, so I think that's that's important for for us tonight to recognize. When it cut and uh, sorry, one other thing before I go on to the Pacific specifically, um, you also have um, and I know there might be an opportunity later on for us to discuss, but you also have the what they call the Jogjakarta principles. Uh, and Jogjakarta is a is a city in uh, in Indonesia, and, and it's named the Jogjakarta Principles because these principles were formulated uh, at a workshop there. Um, the Jogjakarta Principles outline a set of international principles relating to sexual orientation and gender identity, um, and it's a universal guide. So it's a guide only. It's uh, some principles uh, around human rights, which affirm um, legal standards um, at the uh, international human rights level. So, um, and, and there are a set of principles on the application of international human rights law in relation to sexual orientation and gender identity. So what this is, is it's, you know, people came around and said, let's, let's put together based on international human rights law, let's put together a set of principles on how these international human rights law relate to sexual orientation and gender identity. Um, so again, that's, I think it's important that we, we understand that there are some principles out there, the Jogjakarta principles, um, which talk to sexual orientation and gender identity. So as I said, UDHR, um, the, the two con international conventions that I mentioned, you've also got the Jogjakarta principles, all of which um, talk to uh, equality and non-discrimination. Coming to the Pacific, what does it all mean? Um, in the Pacific, you've got seven countries which still criminalize same-sex conduct. And you've got the Cook Islands, you've got Kiribati, um, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Solomons, uh, Tonga, and I think it's Tuvalu is the seventh. Um, same-sex conduct was only decriminalized in Nauru in 2016, so only recently. So seven countries in the Pacific still criminalize same-sex conduct. Um, across the globe, I can't recall the exact number, but that's obviously a significant number. Um, you know, Vanuatu and Fiji have shown leadership in this region um, through de decriminalizing same-sex conduct in 2007 and 2010. Um, in Fiji, 
we also have the constitutional prohibition on discrimination on the grounds of sexual orientation or gender identity and expression. Uh, I think Abdul, you mentioned that in your in your introductory comments. So you know, Fiji across the region has played a, a leading role somewhat. Um, recently, some of you may be aware that um, in the Cook Islands, they were debating uh, some reforms, potential reforms to the Crimes Act. And in the course of that debate, they were looking at decriminalization of um, same-sex conduct. But um, ultimately there was, they've, I think, I, I don't know whether any of you know what the latest is, but I think they've suspended those consultations because um, one of the issues of contention was the decriminalization. Um, I know in, in uh, the Cook Islands, some faith-based leaders did say that, um, you know, that uh, they were prepared to decriminalize, but I know um, there were other faith leaders who opposed it. Um, so it, it was an issue. And at the moment, the, the consultations around potential reform of the Crimes Act, I think is, is suspended. But the interesting thing is, you know, um, a lot of, a lot of opposition in the Pacific is supposedly around um, conduct which is opposed to Pacific culture and practice. But interestingly, the laws that um, criminalize same-sex conduct, uh, you know, were inherited from colonial times. Um, you know, so that you know that that makes for an interesting an interesting discussion. But um, in so so that's that's to just to give you a bit of a uh, an idea around the situation in the Pacific. Um, you know, Fiji through its prohibition in the constitution, uh, a, a leader. Um, seven countries that still um, uh, that still have um, on their books um, the criminalization of same-sex conduct. Um, the other point, very quickly, the other point I want to make is that um, the only Fiji, Samoa, and Tuvalu are the only Pacific Island countries with national human rights commissions. I think that's the other thing that's um, that's also important to to point out. Um, because national human rights institutions or commissions can be um, a mechanism uh, to be used to to address some of the dis to address the discrimination that um, those in the LGBTQI plus communities face on, on a daily basis. So you know, while you have um, you know it's it's one thing to have laws on the books. Uh, but the live reality, as we all know, can always be, um, can always, is often, and in most cases, very different to the equality and non-discrimination provisions that are on the books and in the constitution. It's good on paper, um, you know, in reality, um, you know, what does it mean is really the question that all of us um, have to deal with. So I might just stop there, uh, Abdul, at this point and, um, we can uh, come back to this or move on uh, to other issues um, in due course. Thank you. Thank you, Miles. That was a very comprehensive outlook on what does the legislative or policy level frameworks uh, look like in the region. Now, with the, in line with that same question to Isikeli and Miki, uh, could you possibly expand on the entry points that the LGBT movements on a national or a regional level have had in, for example, consultations on a national level or regional frameworks uh, in trying to advance the human rights of the LGBT people. And I say that because we have, as Miles said, human rights is a provision that lots of countries have ratified, have included into their um, constitution and other laws and acts is just the application is uh, what is possibly lacking. So maybe we start with Isikeli and then we'll move on to Miki. Thank you, Abdul, and thank you, Miles. Um, 
and just to, I think, add on uh, to Miles. Um, presentation is the LGBTQI movement, like as one of the entry, uh, entry points of trying to change laws and policies, uh, like to other conventions that we um, have uh, provided progress reports on to try and influence change also within our countries are uh, the CEDO. The Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of um, Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. So I think last year, the year before last, Samoa was reviewed and we had um, members of the LGBTQ community presenting uh, to the review committee that uh, flew over to Samoa for that uh, particular consultation. So we promote and advance uh, and spotlight the issues faced by lesbian women, bisexual women, queer women and trans women and gender non-conforming people within uh, the reporting mechanism for CEDAW. And the same we have tried to do through the conventions on the rights of the child. We have LGBTQI children, you all know that. We were all children at one stage. So that's also another international legal framework that uh, some countries in the Pacific that have uh, um, signed up for or ratified. We also try and use those opportunities to spotlight issues that are faced by LGBTQ children and also women. And we are hoping to do the same with the conventions on the rights of people with disabilities. We haven't done any work, but uh, there's opportunity to do a scoping exercise and just see uh, how inclusive uh, the CPD is towards uh, LGBTQI uh, people with disabilities. And at the national, at the regional level, we have uh, tried to use a regional approach through the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat uh, to uh, push and lobby for the decriminalization of uh, LGBTQI people in the Pacific, particularly in the seven countries that still criminalize homosexuality. Um, unfortunately, the, the leaders uh, have not uh, endorsed this. I was present at the 2017 um, Pacific Leaders Meeting in Samoa, where I made a presentation uh, like promoting three uh, key things, one of which was the decriminalization of LGBTQI people in those seven countries. Uh, and then two other things, I think the other one was on data. Uh, this was never mentioned in the communique. And when we followed up with the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, we were told maybe we should start with uh, sensitizing, like our work could perhaps uh, start with sensitizing the staff at the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat and the crop agencies so that they become sensitized with our issues. And uh, hopefully, you know, this will make the journey through that easier. So that's something uh, that we are still waiting on the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat to pick up uh, on, uh, despite our numerous uh, follow-ups with them. And at uh, the country level in Tonga, uh, Tonga, Cook Islands, and Kiribati, uh, the three countries that we know our members are doing some work to try and influence uh, change at the uh, at the law or at the legal level. In Tonga, they've had a couple of uh, they've had many. Uh, consultations with the community. And I think one of the pieces of work that they are doing now is they've been asked by the parliament to translate the SOGIAS glossary to Tongan vernacular. And I believe that they are probably have completed that or, or something that they're going to complete this year. Um, and they will, uh, they have engaged one of our members to and also from within Tonga legal fraternity to help them with the law uh, reforms uh, in country. 
and in Cook Islands, the Tetiare Association and the Pride Cook Islands, they are uh, they have the expertise within the network and they have kept also uh, with uh, Cook Islanders who live in uh, New Zealand, I think, to assist. And they have a lot of allies also uh, in country, like individuals and organizations that support them, that uh, is assisting them to push for that uh, uh, removal of uh, homosexuality as a crime from the New Crimes Act. And in uh, Kiribati, I believe um, Tebeo may have mentioned this uh, at the session last week or the week before last, where they are also uh, starting by uh, implementing anti-discrimination campaigns. Okay, so they're doing communication campaigns on social media, on mainstream media, and also out in the communities. Um, to try and get people uh, on board to support uh, to support their their effort towards changing uh, the laws in Kiribati. So yeah, um, each country uh, doing things uh, the way they know that it will work for them. There's no uh, there's no one way uh, of doing it uh, or standard way of doing it. Each is doing it uh, the way they know it will work in their own respective uh, contexts. And I'll probably just pass on to Mickey to uh, share and spotlight the progress in Fiji and maybe other countries too, and I can just add on. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Yeah. Um, Mickey, before you answer that question, I just wanted to add if you could also maybe, along with the question, expand a little bit on uh, the justice and the security system in the terms of courts and uh, the court system and uh, the police force system, how do they play into the, what you say, uh, access to justice uh, through uh, laws and conventions or policies and acts of the country and how they don't, or how they do or don't work with the LGBT community? Okay, thank you, Abdul, and Vinaka Sikeli and Miles for your response. Um, like Miles, I want to take a moment to uh, share my acknowledgement to the Embassy of the United States of America here in Fiji and all the countries that it works with in, in, in the region right now um, for bringing, and, uh, bringing everybody together on this platform and to spotlight the, uh, a very important, um, a very important um, not just subject, uh, but a moment in, in, in time. Um, we're in a pandemic, we have to recognize that. And a lot of us have to do a lot of these events virtually and the virtual sessions are never easy. So thank you to Abdul Abikesh and the team and the Youth Council. Um, you're doing a great job. Um, so well done and, and thank you so much for doing this. Um, as we speak, there are some progresses um, in terms of um, how we uh, see the new administration. So we can see that the Biden administration has brought about um, a few interesting resolutions and reform in terms of working for gender equality, particularly on LGBTIQ equality across the world in the North and the South. And recently, um, and very interesting, and I think this will add to the framework conversation later on, um, which is a very good entry point, by the way. Um, a, a friend of mine, and also Skelly's, her name is Jessica Stern, who is the current executive director of an NGO that's based in Manhattan, New York, um, called Outright Action International. And so their work is based on LGBTIQ equality across the world. Sorry, Mickey, could you come a little bit closer to the mic? You're just a little bit low oh. on the speaker. Oh, can you hear me now? Yep, this is better. Sorry, please continue. Okay. So apart from my ginormous forehead on the screen right now, can you hear me better, Abdul? Okay. Yep, yep. All right. And so um, I don't know where I had left off from that I was not properly, uh, that it wasn't microphoned enough, but um, let me just do this, hang on a second. Oh, uh, you were yeah. talking about how yours and Isikeli's friend uh, and telling a story, yeah. Right, right, right. And so um, this is going to help in terms of not just a, uh, a progressive pathway, but also it's going to help in terms of 
like one of your asks, which is around the entry points in terms of you know engagements, etc. And so um, Jessica Stern, who's a very good friend of ours, um, who's based in Manhattan, New York, that works for Outright Action International, and is the executive director, recently has been appointed as the um, envoy, the envoy of um, LGBTI equality um, for the for, for America. So. Um, uh, that in itself with that new announcement and what that means um, for foreign policy across the world is, is super important um, because of um, the current engagement that um, the United States has in terms of with countries across the world and here in the Pacific um, and through the DRL, which um, um, the United States government has been able to fund and support work um, for queer equality across, especially in Asia Pacific. Um, one of the key highlights is also the recognition, as Miles was saying, in terms of the overall international um, human rights framework. And to break that up a bit more for queer equality and lens, um, it comes down to understanding and recognizing the Jogjakarta principles, which is the um, application of human rights law in relation to persons of diverse sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, and very recently, sex characteristics. Um, and it is through the Jogjakarta principles, which is sort of the Bill of Rights for LGBT equality across the world, that it provides um, a gender just and response in terms of um, queer equality across the world. And so in the Pacific, um, there has been some um, interesting recognition um, activists have been able to participate to the first round of the um, Jogjakarta principles for colleagues at Ilga Shenya to uh, Ilga in general to what I'm aware of, and in the in in the days when um, it came to its review, which is now the Jogjakarta Plus Ten, it also saw contributions from folks in the Pacific. Um, so through the Jogjakarta principle, which is also like a human rights mechanism that you can utilize, um, it allows people in the countries, uh, member organizations and affiliates who do work on um, queer equality generally, to be able to um, utilize this as references in terms of not just state accountability, but also ensure that some of the recommendations are also cross-linked um, that can also be um, a way of moving reform um, in, in very bits and pieces in the countries. I have to say that I, um, to date, I have not seen um, a country in the Pacific, um, and I don't think there is right now, that has a um, clear legislative and jurisprudential framework for LGBTI persons um, in, in the region. But I do know that there are um, um, efforts and, and folks that are working towards um, setting it up. So bits and pieces of it have been put together. And when I say bits and pieces, I'm also referring to um, reform and repeals that have been taking place um, through good practices and human rights compliance, um, whether for instance, for, for instance, through you know, rape laws. Um, Fiji is an example as well in terms of having gender gap um, in the crimes law. Um, we also have protection uh, for employment, the uh, recent employment promulgation um, prohibits discrimination on sexual orientation, um, and then you have the constitutional provisional protection on non-discrimination of S, O, G, I, and E. It's not enough, right? You need, you need an actual framework in the system, in the countries, to be able um, to ensure that we are really working for justice. I don't think that um, uh, it is a lot of people understand um, with the folks that are not queer people, but like a lot of hetero folks um, that work within the system do not understand the amount of energy and effort and resources it has taken um, the bodies of uh, indigenous and people of color, brown um, and black skin folks in the region, uh, that kind of energy to move this work with very limited resources. Um, and, you know, we know for a fact that a lot of this criminal um, laws um, and, and, and policies and practices are very much exported from colonial powers and empires, um, if you look back at the history. And so that really has a huge cost and, and, 
and an impact and effect on the lives of queer people in the Pacific today. So it's sort of like reversing, we have to work against it and, and try to decolonize it in so many ways. And, and doing that alone isn't enough. Um, you have to work with so many allies and, and having real and very honest and hard conversations. And I guess maybe one of the real and hard conversations I have to ask as well um, on this platform is really, um, where are uh, where where are the resources for um, legislative reform work in the Pacific right now? Um, what is what does um, legislative and policy uh, frameworks for our communities look like? So we have to ask ourselves this question. I'm not asking for anybody's responses in particular, but these are just questions that we can take a moment to, you know, stand back and just reflect on it. Um, the other thing I wanted to also say is in terms of um, in national frameworks and how that is taken in the regional and national context, we also have mechanisms, excuse me, <laughs> God, I'm having hot flushes, so that's I'm having my fan because um, of my treatment and life and that I'm super fatty. Um, one of the things that we need to recognize in human rights mechanisms as well is the independent expert uh, for the first time ever in the history of Human Rights Council and the UN we can say is the adoption through a resolution of having an independent expert on sexual orientation and gender identity, Victor, um, who is of Latin American descent, who uh, by the way, um, um, has also, through his office, they've received so much attacks, even within the Human Rights Council itself. But just the, uh, just that re resolution and adoption of having that um, portfolio, right? Mm -hmm. And you can see that at various levels, global, regional, and national, things aren't easy for queer quality. Um, and, and through the independent expert, um, many of us have been able to work directly through these systems to ensure that when our countries um, have their hearings, not just in terms of universal periodic review, but in terms of other processes like treaty reviews, um, be it CEDAW, CRC, ONCAD, ICESCAR, ICPR, through these processes and mechanisms, um, you can utilize the independent expert and you know, um, you can have very open conversations with the independent expert. The expert works for us in our community. And so you can work through PSGDN or ILGA Ocean or APTN, or even through organizations um, that already have these linkages with um, the independent expert's office to ensure that um, if there are things that we want assistance in, um, in terms of you know, drafting, um, shadow reports, et cetera, that, um, that the independent the independence experts office usually provides some kind of support, including um, various other organizations like ILGA in the world. PSGDN has also helped. I also know um, HRSD um, has also helped um, in the different countries reporting as well. And, and it's important that we know these things. Um, um, how does a framework look like is, is an important question as well, because um, if you take a look at the case for Fiji, and I have to put this out, um, we do have a very lovely constitution, call it whatever you want, with your respect, um, um, but a constitutional protection isn't enough, okay? And so whilst we have a constitutional provision for protection on the grounds of SOGI and E, we know for a fact that following that, you don't have any other consistent follow-up um, laws and policies in place that work towards um, the constitutional protection. If we go back to 2000 and uh, 1997, uh, through the Reeves Constitution Committee and the Reeves Constitution, um, Fiji became the second country in the world to have uh, mentioned sexual orientation, um, the protection uh, for persons of diverse sexual orientation. Um, so we became the second country to South Africa in the world. And in 2009, we already see saw a um, abrogation. And in the process of that, I do know for a fact that a lot of um, some of the cases that have been brought to court um, has been about utilizing that constitutional 97 protection. And then in 2009, following the abrogation, 
to 2010, where Fiji, uh, for the very first time, had decriminalized um, same-sex relations, um, which was a sodomy, um, which was a colonial sodomy era law. Um, also saw and sparked an interesting conversation to gear up um, folks in the community um, to ensure that you know you you don't just have decriminalization. And I think that's important to say. This isn't about decriminalization. Decriminalization is one thing. Having a framework is another. And ensuring that the framework has different tools around it is also equally important. Um, and the system needs like a whole, um, well, I'll just say system change, like you'd understand that. And so in 2013, before the, the 2013 constitution came out, we had obviously the, the 2013 Const People's Constitution, where uh, people of diverse communities came together to make submissions to the um, Guy Commission. Um, it's important to recognize that members of Fiji's queer community had coordinated, had conspired um, at a particular place, and had, uh, and I think that was one of the first times ever we saw Fijian activists come together in all the diverse NGOs um, to make a collective submission. And we know that um, the submission of the People's Constitution wasn't um, something that was welcomed by the then leaders. And then in 2000, in that particular same year, the announcement of a new constitution came about. And so with, with the clear mention um, on section 26 of the constitution on the protection of the grounds of sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, um, you know, for many of us, um, it looks good when it's there, but I have to say, like, like I've mentioned before, like it isn't enough, right? And so that's important to note. But it's important that while it's there, everyone has the responsibility, the co-responsibility efforts to ensure that we move towards um, working around having a, a framework that speaks to the full recognition and the protection of um, the rights of LGBTQI people across the spectrum. And, and not just the rights and recognition, but also um, the resources that can be available to, to move other work in, um, in countries like Fiji. Um, I do also recognize that there's many kinds of reform that has taken place across the different parts of different Pacific Island countries that Miles and IV has already touched on. And so that's just a brief case in terms of like um, some of the challenges and, and the realities and the story and the struggle of what it means to actually look at a framework um, for a case and example Fiji. Um, and I do hope that other countries in the region um, can have the same energy and, and effort um, to work collectively with other countries to be able to um, make these legislative and policy changes reform and, and systematically ensure that frameworks um, that work to the advantage of human rights and for our community matters and is also um, linked into um, the work that they are doing in their countries. I'll stop there for now. Abdul, can I just uh, just you, Mickey, very... That was very comprehensive in uh, in terms of speech. And yeah, I, I was actually going to come to you, Miles, and you could add your response uh, with that. And my question with what discussion we had was simply, uh, as SPC is part of crop, you know, the council, the, the regional, that's something I forgot. It's a, it's a consortium of uh, Pacific intergovernmental agencies like USP, PIPS, SPC, it's PREP. So, you know, what, what role do these inter, uh, intergovernmental regional organizations also play in creating that platform? For example, PIPS has got a CSO forum, which feeds into the Pacific leaders meeting. So what role does, uh, you know, these organizations play in providing those entry points, those mm. support, uh, be it uh, in terms of finance, be it in terms of technical, be it in terms of providing platform, what roles do, do you think these organizations can play? And those LGBT uh, activists who are here, how can they utilize it? So your response to that. Yeah, maybe thank you. Question. Yes, thank you, Abdul. Um, thank you for the question. I think that that's a very good question because if you, you need to understand uh, what each crop agency does, what its mandate is. And, you know, I think the Forum Island Secretariat, the Pacific Islands Forum Secretariat, uh, PIFS, is, is an important one in this space because 
pits works with leaders it works with countries it works at that high level and sets the um, strategic and policy and uh, direction for the region it sets these um, the agenda if you like and so for example uh, through PIFs, through the forum leaders, we have the um, gender equality declaration. So Pacific uh, leaders have come together and they've developed, with the assistance of the Secretariat, a gender equality declaration. So that's important. And that declaration then informs organizations like ours, SBC, which is a technical organization, to then implement um, we look at the declaration and then we say, okay, how can we give effect to that declaration across the Pacific? So working with PIFs to, um, through PIFs to develop a similar kind of a framework for the Pacific would be one way to then, um, as, you know, as Mickey says, to develop um, a framework across the region or nationally. You know, it's, a, it's a regional, but organization but obviously you implement nationally um, but usp also plays a key role i mean usp obviously as we all know is a is an institution for learning and so that is again a space where i think uh, a lot of these issues can be discussed debated um, it's around changing minds and changing attitudes yes um, it's around um, changing behaviors so the universities will can play a big role um, the universities in Fiji, plus as a crop agency, the University of the South Pacific is, is also important. But I wanted just to go back and touch on something that Mickey discussed uh, around resourcing and support. And I'm looking across because we deal a lot with uh, donors. And to me, the, the US um, is probably the one donor, the one country that invests um, relatively heavily in um, LGBTQI issues, plus issues. I think, um, you know, Australia and New Zealand um, don't to the same extent, um, neither does the European Union nor um, other donors in the region. So, um, so just come in the US and uh, I think that's, uh, that's important to, to understand. The other point I just wanted to raise is that, um, you know, uh, there was, I think it was, was it you, I, IV, or was it Mickey said that they, I think it was you, IV, you mentioned that you addressed Pacific leaders um, some years ago. And, um, you know, we deal with governments as an intergovernmental organization, SBC, we, we deal with governments on a regular basis. And, you know, I can tell you that um, the appetite amongst leaders isn't great. Um, so, how do you, you know, which comes back to this fundamental question, how do you move the issues or progress the issues if you know that the leaders uh, are not necessarily, it doesn't mean that they um, are, are, are anti, but for them, it's not high on their agenda. It's not high on their priority list. So how do you bring it higher onto the leaders uh, priority list. How do you engage the broader community to make bring it uh, make it an issue that that leaders consider to be a priority? You know that's that's a fundamental question, and that requires uh, a broad approach, uh, looking at a, a a coalition or an alliance of um, of allies working together, and and looking at how other you know I look at. Um, the gender equality uh, work, for example, you know, 30 years ago, when Shamima Ali was talking about domestic violence, you know, she was the lone voice in many ways, you know, over time, um, you know, it's now, um, it's, it now has a legitimate uh, uh, seat at the, at the discourse, right? You know, learning from from that, how have they managed? It, it's been a long journey, but surely there's some lessons learned there. Looking at, um, you know, looking at some other campaigns, it, you know, taking into account. Um, so, for example, the I know this is not an issue for the Pacific. It's not a priority for the Pacific. I I mean, I'm talking about same sex marriage. It's it's not an issue on. It's not a priority, I should say. But looking at something like that and how has that worked 
you know, in Ireland, for example, of all places, Ireland, uh, you know, staunchly Catholic, and um, but they managed to to you know the community, uh, you know what what was the strategy that worked there, and you know just looking at you know back in the back then i was um, just doing a bit of research around it and it was around communication you know how do you communicate how do you undertake research to inform what you do research research to to inform strategy um you know those are the kinds of you know, all the preparatory work that they did before they went into a campaign all of those things are very very um informative and instructive uh, I, I leave it at there and um, uh, happy to hear from Ivy. Look forward to hearing from Ivy on this. Thank you. Ivy, uh, thank you. Thank you, Miles. And thank you for directing it to I, uh, Ivy because I also wanted Ivy to touch on something. I think a few days ago, uh, Ivy and I work at, are at the same workplace. And Ivy mentioned something that I hope I had and I wanted Ivy to bring that into focus was when you look at gender as an issue, for women and children, they are line ministries for policy making, for policy lobbying. Whereas the LGBT community does not have line ministries or agencies uh, that they could go to. So what the LGBT community has ended up doing, which is good, but it's also a bit difficult to navigate is, so we choose for issue areas like, okay, we're going to look at climate change. So we're going to go to the climate change division. We are going to look at DRR. So we're going to, in PG sense, go to the NDMO. We are going to look at human rights. So we'll go to the Human Rights Commission. So LGBT policy making and lobbying has been in piecemeal. And that's a good thing because you are inserting uh, the, uh, the soldier's uh, lens to different parts. But at the same time, it's a very difficult thing to have an overarching national approach to LGBT issues. So uh, basically, I, I'm wondering if you could a little bit expand on that and the difficulties and the uh, opportunities that this currently provides by not having a line ministry for the LGBT community. Thank you, um, Mickey, uh, Miles, and also Abdul for uh, Mickey and Miles for your sharing and also Abdul for the the question, yes, uh, this has been our struggle for many years, uh, ever since Fiji has um, included uh, the prohibition of uh, discrimination based on SOGI, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression under the Bill of Rights in the 2013 constitution. We have been lobbying with different um, government ministries and uh, recently in the national budget consultations with the attorney general, I did uh, raise this with him that it's been difficult for us to move most of the work that we do and also help members of the LGBTQI community realize and reach their full potential because of the prohibitions or the protection, the legal protections that is in the constitution because we, are, we do not have a home ministry that can take up the LGBTQI portfolio and for us to work through. But he has advised um, at the end of the, uh, in our uh, discussions that we should work with the Fiji Human Rights and Anti-Discrimination Commission, which had sort of started the work a little bit with the LGBTQI community in Fiji to develop a national LGBTQI policy. So I guess uh, that is probably uh, the state, uh, not the state, the independent institution that government expects us to work through and maybe submit our budget submissions and our plans uh, through. And that's, that came from the Ministry of Economy, uh, Minister for Economy himself. So we'll try that uh, strategy uh, and work with the Human Rights and Anti Discrimination Commission. If it doesn't work, then we'll go back to uh, the Minister for Economy. But yes, for the previous years, we have uh, worked directly with uh, the live ministries for different, for various issues that are important to LGBTQI people, like HIV, mental health, through the Ministry of Health, um, 
for LBQ women through uh, the Ministry of Women and the National Gender Policy. Although uh, we had really strong LGBTQI organizations and feminist organizations pushing for SOGESC, um, mainstreaming within the National Gender Policy. I think in the current policy, they just added up it being mentioned once or twice. So there's uh, very little that has been said about SOGESC uh, in the current policy, but I think they're going to review it uh, sometime soon. And also with the climate change, we've had to work directly with the climate change uh, a division uh, at the Ministry of uh, Economy uh, to push for climate justice issues. In a way, it's good because we are planting ourselves and we're sensitizing these ministries um, on SOGESC, and it's sort of also paving the way for mainstreaming of SOGESC uh, across all sectors, which is also something that we would like. Uh, to promote, but uh, like you said, it's easier if we like embed ourselves in a particular ministry and we do the work uh, from there uh, through that particular ministry, and of course, in partnership and in collaboration with civil society organizations that are working specifically with LGBTQI people. And having said that, I just wanted to also share that uh, I, I currently look after two organizations, so uh, the sharing that I'm going to do in relation to Fiji is through my experience as the, the volunteer head of the organization Rainbow Pride Foundation, which I had sort of founded in 2014. So we are also doing a lot of work to try and influence uh, policy and the legal framework. So we are going to be launching soon our handbook for parliamentarians, um, where we have included some key information, like some of the legislative gaps, some of the gaps in the current uh, legislation, uh, like in the constitution, although they have uh, legal protections for LGBTQI people, there are also limitations. So we cannot, uh, same-sex couples cannot adopt children. You cannot inherit your partner's uh, properties uh, when he or she or they, they her dies. Uh, and you cannot marry or have a civil union with a partner. So those are some of the limitations that we also uh, would like to address. And uh, these I have elevated also to the Pacific, to the regional uh, space. And I'll be going to the regional space. I'll be next week from Monday, from tomorrow, are they going to, there's going to be a regional CSO forum organized by the PIFs, where we will be looking at the 2050 strategy. So I am going to push for the vision of the PSGDM, which is for Pacific Islanders of diverse soldiers uh, being able to live, a, um, live healthy, safe, uh, prosperous, uh, lives in fully inclusive um, and just specific societies. So this might mean removing those limitations. That's 2050. None of us will probably be here, but we want to leave the world a better place for our uh, LGBTQI, for our, our LGBTQI children and those who are also going to come after that. Um, so like Miles had said it's probably going to be a difficult uh, conversation, but we will need to also do our homework to be able to navigate within um, that space. And also just to add to what Miles have shared, um, like the leaders uh, have already agreed on the Pacific uh, gender equality framework. So some of the work or the advocacy that we are trying to do at the regional level, we are using uh, the passage where we are using that pathway, we're using the gender equality framework to try and uh, push for some of the things that we want, like um, having expanding uh, collection of sex uh, desegregated data to gender desegregated data. And I know my must have probably heard this many times, uh, are saying this, that we would also like 
to um, um, ask our development partners and all civil society and governments the possibility of expanding the definition of gender uh, using a queer perspective of queer theory where we look at gender as occurring on a spectrum rather than a, rather than a gender binary, just men and women. And we will continue to have this uh, conversation, uh, perhaps until we die, but it's important that we have those conversations uh, now and taking it forward. That's why we're sharing with you who are all on this call so that you can also continue that conversations in whatever spaces uh, you are in. Mm. And um, we're also working with the faith-based organizations. This is in Fiji, the Rainbow Pride Foundation. Like Miles have said, we need to uh, get as many people on board to buy into uh, the cause that we are trying to push for and promote. So we are working, the Rainbow Pride Foundation is working with the Fiji Council of Churches to try and uh, work with them to help change some of the um, some of the negative uh, perceptions, uh, attitudes and values that are so deeply entrenched within some people that uh, leads them to being uh, perpetrators of violence and discrimination against uh, LGBTQI people. Probably I'll stop there, Abdul. Abdul, can I just, I mean, I think what uh, IV has spoken about is is the right strategy. I mean, you're, you're working across a lot of spaces and you're, uh, if you like, mainstreaming the issues. Um, but the other thing is the private sector is also another important um, stakeholder. And I think you probably find that there are many within that space with the um, views that are very supportive and mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day you know you've got what do what does what will move the dial for governments what will move the dial for members of parliament you know they will they what will move their dial is if they can see the benefit what is the benefit of legal reform or what is the benefit of this framework that mickey was talking about and if you can show, for example, like we go back to um, those that advocate in the uh, gender-based violence space, if we know they've been showing that gender-based violence means that the private sector loses money and so mm. that it hurts the economy, it hurts Fiji's economy, it hurts Papua New Guinea's economy. So it, uh, it, it comes down to dollars and cents. So you, you, you get people, you know, you get the, the dial move because you can show that there is some benefit in supporting a particular, in supporting a particular uh, campaign or, or um, position. Um, yeah, that's, that's important. But I really like what you've just said in terms of what you're doing. Um, Ivy, I think it's important that you work across. Thank you. I absolutely agree. And I just wanted to add on from where you left off, Miles, and feeding off to where um, I Thank you, Miles. I'm going to. Oh, oh sure, Mickey. Sorry, excuse me. No problem. Excuse me. Go ahead, Abdul. No, 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 no. Uh, let, let me just pose a question so that you could uh, have your response uh, uh, to Miles and uh, Isikeli and the question also. I'm only doing that because we do have some questions in the chat that I haven't been able to ask but I think we could actually fit this in at this point. We, we'll go on for another 10, 10 minutes maybe. It's already 8.37 here. So um, for Mickey, one of the questions that has come and I want to, I want to mix the uh, question is, is there any comparative data on the abuses of the LGBT community in terms of hate crime and violence and death due to hate crimes? And then expanding to the last question I had, with that data, the justice system, the correction system, one of the questions which came with this, so it's one or two questions, yeah? So data, uh, the access to justice systems, access to the security forces, and the kind of rights of choosing, for example, if you're a trans woman, you're still being put in the um, men's prison, and that is posing so much risk and uh, potential for harm for prisoners who are with diverse soldiers. So, how can we walk around that? What is the current system like right now? Has there been any outreach? 
to change policies and laws around that. So if you can answer that. Also a question on drug use and sex workers. And something that we forget a lot, I think, is that there are, there are, there are sex workers within the LGBT community who uh, may have had to enter the trade because of the discrimination being, uh, have, having to move out of their houses because of their choice uh, to be themselves, you know? So if you could just frame your uh, responses around that. I know it's a lot, but I'm trying to answer the other questions from the chat. So over to you, Miki. Okay, no problem. So I, w I will feed up from uh, where Miles had left off as well as Kelly. One of the critical things I think that's important right now is also transformative philanthropy. We really have to move around transforming philanthropy. Um, questions about where are the resources uh, for queer equality work in the region, but also everywhere else. I agree with Miles, I concur in terms of the US State Department being the only sort of um, um, current uh, you know, government that um, has a, a certain engagement um, through their foreign policy now um, and also before, um, although it was a bit tricky during the previous administration, but the administration before as well. Um, and so with the now foreign policies and how we're seeing um, the trajectory of um, supporting um, the State Department having to support equality through the establishment as well of a new envoy for queer equality, to utilize um, the platforms that are available to, to advance um, resources for queer quality, because the fact of the reality, we can do so much um, uh, work, but it also needs resources, right? Um, so I just wanted to say that very last thing. In terms of like regional solidarity and support, um, one of the things that I guess we can move leaders um, to really listen um, in a very more practical approach is also ensuring that a statement is to be delivered at, um, the, to the forum leaders to really detail not just the murder and killing of our friends like Polly, um, who, you know, got us rest on um, Polly's um, life and in power, but also the many other um, cases of murder that we've seen across the region, Cindy, um, Magnus and Lucky, and we speak their names because this is important. Um, and many other cases across the region um, that we've seen suicide cases as well as murder, mm -hmm. um, violence, um, including diverse forms of discrimination. So there's so much um, that can be put into mm -hmm. and that needs to be issued um, to the forum leaders to pay much of an urgent, um, uh, have much more of an urgent um, understanding and, and where they need to start really thinking about their people um, because there are many other intersections that are involved. Um, the Pacific is yet to discuss collectively stuff around not just gender equality for other diverse gender groups, but also stuff around that's coming up like climate um, and, and, you know, um, uh, climate migration in particular, which is going to be big for the Pacific. Um, so it's important that we do ensure that some of these statements um, are delivered to the governments, that hold them to account. As duty bearers, you have to uphold not just the fundamental rights of, of the citizens of Oceania, but you have to respond in a just manner um, to what's taking place. And I have to say that this is also an act of injustice because we haven't seen Pacific leaders come together to make statements um, about advancing the human rights of LGBTQI persons in, in the region in particular, and that's needed. That's, that has to happen. Um, it is unpacific to not have uh, governments um, to, 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 to not respond. They have to. It's the Pacific way. If you call it the Pacific way in a Pacific culture, then you have to respond to these things, including the injustices. And to bring things back to scene of injustice and justice, um, Abdul's question you ask around um, data, having uh, the segregated sex and gender desegregated data um, in the system is important. Uh, we have had numerous researchers. RPF has had his own research regionally. There's also been some work around research um, in terms of law reform as well. Um, and I have to say, I know for the very first time in the Pacific, Fiji has been a pilot country um, ever since 2019. Um, the very first research on LGR, which is legal gender recognition, 
um, is a, a study that is now um, in its final stages, um, which will be available sometimes in the third quarter of 2021. We'll see how things go with this pandemic as well. And that's a very interesting piece um, of research. So for the very first time, Fiji and the Pacific will see a legal gender recognition um, document um, which speaks towards um, the urgency of not just ending forms of criminalization in the bodies of uh, queer people, but really um, what it means to have um, recognition um, of identities that actually matter. So that's important. Um, the other thing is numerous researches have been carried out in the Pacific, in Papua New Guinea, Samoa, and Fiji through a social experience survey and study, which um, was in partnership with um, the Asia Pacific Trans Network. And today, we know that these researchers are now available and we're still in a pandemic. Um, the research outcomes are going to be published very soon. And so that's, that's something to look out for. Um, and PhDDN is also supporting this. So thank you, Ivy and the team. In Fiji, we also have a um, few researchers as I mentioned, RPF has had one. Um, which is the humanitarian one. I guess that's also a very interesting one, the first of its kind in the region as well. Um, and that has a very clear, lucid um, documentation and very strong recommendations in terms of what humanitarian systems um, must take into account when dealing with our community. For the House of Chameleon, for a very first time in PG, a research was taken in 2018. Um, it is now available, it is 2021. And so this research looked into um, specifically access to justice um, on the intersectional injustice component. And um, the research data is very interesting and important in itself. Um, it has very clearly shown that at most 70% of transgender women um, experience diverse forms of violence in the homes and what it means also to disclose their gender identities. So that in itself um, speaks for itself um, to what transgender women in particular across Fiji um, are experiencing in their homes, intimate partner relationships, um, on the streets, um, through um, their direct uh, attacks from you know, ultra-religious fundamentalists, et cetera. So there's a couple of things. There has been some interesting calls in terms of recommendations in that research in itself. And I guess um, we also need to understand that there are discriminatory uh, texts, not just in the legislation, but also um, within common law. Um, and, and legal practices. So that's important, um, not just the text, but also the practical approach of how lawyers um, are picking um, these laws and utilizing it within the formal justice sector. One of the key recommendations in that research in particular um, is to work with um, the formal justice sector in training um, lawyers that work for the state, but also lawyers that are also, uh, that can provide pro bono support. Um, and also another one would be training the police officers. And so with all of this work you know, together, it also moves into setting up and collaboratively working with organizations like RPF as well, um, having a um, referral pathway um, for action in terms of gender-based violence responses. Where do our community go when we're in the cases of gender-based violence and discrimination, et cetera? The nuances and intersectionality and intersectionalities of sex work is fundamental. Um, there isn't a future if it's not intersectional. Everyone that does this work in LGBTQI equality um, has to recognize the fact that we do have members in our community who are sex workers. So that's important. Fiji and Papua New Guinea um, held a very strong delegation in the years back, I guess it was 2008 or nine, when they had visited um, Pattaya, um, where a declaration was put together by leaders within Asia Pacific. And the declaration is called Pattaya Declaration. It does talk about the commitments of the governments that were present then, Asia and the Pacific, in terms of ensuring that the, the rights of sex workers are upheld and are fully recognized in the end system. So starting with protection. And I guess right now with the police, there's been some interesting work by organizations like Strumpet um, Alliance Network. So the sisters and, and lovely people that I've been work with, uh, Mama June White, who's on this call, hello there, and also Survival Advocacy Network, 
um, they have been um, at the front line and working with us, of course, and RPF and others in terms of um, ensuring that um, uh, there is some form of respect and just responses. Um, we, we've seen in the past how many sex workers are arrested every day and cases are mass cases happen obviously over the weekends and how many of us have to rush to the police stations, not just for bailouts, but to ensure that um, some of the girls and guys are also protected, um, including where we provide litigation support um, through the people that um, serve in our organizations. Um, so we have our own lawyers who, who go to, um, to court to ensure these cases uh, are represented um, and it's important. Um, so with all of that, that's just a brief overview in terms of the, the asks and the responses that have come through. I do have a question that has come directly from Amarama Ranandi, who's part of House Chameleon, and she's very strongly stated that humanitarian response efforts must definitely recognize um, diverse SOGI um, in, in terms of frontline engagement and their protection taken into account the intersectional injustices that take place, especially within the climate um, change spaces and conversations. So that's important. Um, so thank you, Renandi, sweetheart of the South, for asking uh, the question and making that clear affirmation. I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Miki. We, we want to end in the next three, max five minutes. So I have just one last question, which is a question I've asked at the end of every uh, webinar. And that is, how can young people and cis and hetero people be better allies and support systems for the LGBT movement? So I'll, I'll ask all the three panelists to just take a minute and a half each to answer this question before we bring this to an end. I'll start with Isi Kelly. Hi. Abdul, so uh, thank you for your question. Um, at the PSGDN, through um, the support of the US uh, State uh, Department, uh, Bureau of Democracy, Rights and Labor, support uh, that they had channeled through the SBC, we uh, had published a, a publication that was developed by you. Uh, LGBTQ youth from around uh, the region, and the work was led by I think Lani, Miki, and uh, Kiyonse from Samoa Pufapin Association, where they uh, held uh, online dialogues where they collected information and data like on the issues that affect or are important to LGBTQI youth, uh, and also some of their propositions or recommendations um, to um, leaders in different spaces. And this particular uh, toolkit is available with the PSGTN, which we are happy to share with uh, LGBTQ youth from across uh, the region. And they can use this um, publication as a basis on which they can advocate for various uh, thematic issues pertinent to LGBTQ youth in the various uh, countries. And also uh, what the Rainbow Pride Foundation is doing to try and influence and get uh, more people, particularly allies, uh, into supporting the work of the movement is we build the capacity of LGBTQ youth. So through the Rainbow Pride Foundation, we have about uh, 15 satellite pride hubs up across the country. So each district or each township has a Pride Hub uh, and the members range from 15 to about 50 uh, members. And they are active um, members. We engage them through uh, online discussions, especially now with COVID. So I think there's a couple that's lined up uh, where we're going to build a capacity around different thematic areas and also use the opportunity to uh, talk about issues that are important to them, that are affecting them at uh, the community level, not only they themselves, but also their families and what type of support uh, they need from the secretariat and also from each other. 
And we hope that through this process, they will be able to take the information, uh, the knowledge, the power that uh, we have shared upon ourselves into different phases that they occupy. So some of them hold leadership positions within their community, their youth leaders. Some of them are part of the youth fellowship of their own churches. Some of them are part of the DCOS, District Council of Social Services. Some of them are part of Red Cross. So when we impart this knowledge and information to them around LGBTQ issues, we expect them to take that with them into those spaces and try and influence those spaces. So with Rainbow Pride Foundation, human rights is like number one. Uh, we promote accountability and transparency, democracy. So even within their Pride Hearts, we want them to develop uh, governance or leadership systems that uh, espouse um, and uh, uphold a democratic uh, values and principles. So these are the things that we part with them. And we also teach them how to uh, influence spaces and how to get people um, on board to support the cause that they're promoting. So we hope that through this uh, the empowerment that we provide them, they will go into those spaces, influence those spaces, uh, maybe change the way people think about us, the LGBTQ community, change their hearts, change their minds, turn them around, bring them in, and we'll become friends and they will support the work that we do at uh, the much higher level and also more importantly at the community level to uh, change uh, hearts and minds of other people who probably have very deeply entrenched homophobic and transphobic, biphobic, lesbophobic attitudes towards our community. So I guess um, this is very practical. And uh, the good thing about our community, they're very passionate, you know, when it comes to volunteerism. So they absorb, they just keep on absorbing. Even now, as I look at the screen, they're just saying, man, they love the session because it's very informative. So. Yes, we are sharing this information with you. Uh, my young sisters, brothers, brothers, sisters, so that you will take it out to your communities, to your families, and uh, empower other LGBTQ people, and also uh, our cis allies, and get them in to support the work that we do. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you, Sikeli. Miles, a quick one, minute and a half, if you will. We are almost reaching the two hour mark which was our maximum yes. limit, so thank so you. Um, look, I mean, Iskeli uh, comprehensively provided a, a list of things. Um, you know, those who wish to support the cause will have various levels of um, involvement. And for me, at the very least, is just to understand um, the issues to, at, if at the very least, to understand the issues, um, to be able to empathize and to, when the opportunity arises, to, um, to support in whatever little way, uh, little way or um, big way you can. Um, but at the very least for me, understand the issues. At least um, uh, if you work on that, then you yourself as, a, as an individual, um, if you at this moment not an ally, will become an ally, and that's one less person to convince. Thank you, Miles. Uh, Mickey, quick one minute, two and a half max, please, on how uh, heterosis people could be better allies, young people could be better allies. Okay. And so, you know, a dear young person um, of the now and of the future, I hope that um, when you go to battle, that you remember that you're not alone, that there are a hundred thousands of, um, you know, your ancestors and spirits and people of our own that are with you um, fighting this battle, because it isn't a battle, it, it, it really is a battle. Um, and that in co-creating um, spaces of realities and a culture that can be um, open for our own people. Um, may we learn to have fun, okay? Um, intergenerational uh, co-leadership, equity and justice is important. And in it all, we have to have fun. 
you know, sometimes we may have disagreements to what older people think or to what many others um, of different ideologies think. Um, but I speak to you as members of our community, you're never alone, okay? And when you need to reach out, you know how to do it. You have to know where to go. And as you navigate your journey, take care of yourself. Um, it has never been easy. Um, people in our movement fall, okay? People also find themselves, um, you know, just battled with all kinds of um, elements, whether it's um, ultra-religious fundamentalists or trans-exclusionary radical feminists or um, hetero-patriarchal militarized uh, folks. Um, it is important in it all as you navigate uh, that may you receive um, the power and support. Um, and, and also one of the biggest things that's important for us is co-responsibility uh, co and co-solidarity and power for action onward and forward. We have to um, find ourselves um, unifying to do this work all together and we can do it together, you know. We've, we've um, held our flowers together in our hands, even between our teeth. When war takes control over our own bodies, we can do it together. Um, I don't think there's anything that's going to stop um, our young people, our millennials right now of color, indigenous millennials, as well as um, post millennials. Um, get on board. Um, and, and, you know, there's going to be victories. Every day is a victory. And the moment you step out of your own comfort, you know that in itself is a revolution, it's a political act, it's a warfare, it's, it represents self-determination, and you are um, uh, stepping in um, uh, to, to share something that, you know, that inspires and gives hope to someone else that may not have um, the luxury of time, resource, and space to do so. With those few words, I just want to say thank you to many young people across Oceania that are picking up this cause now to, to move it forward, you know. Um, so I appreciate you and I love you. And I share with you our pride, blessings, and kisses. And you got this. <coughs> and with that, thank you, Isikeli. Uh, thank you, Mickey. Thank you, Miles for joining us for the final webinar for 2021 Pride Month by the U.S. Embassy Suva uh, and the U.S. Embassy Youth Council. This has been a great four weeks for me personally, moderating the past four sessions. I have learned a lot uh, and I hope that I'm able to empower others uh, that I meet, that I talk to about these issues. And I hope that all of those who have joined us over the past four weeks or on different calls, uh, different webinars, are, have learned something, have, uh, if at the very least it allows you to question something and find out information, then I feel that from myself, uh, Avikesh and the lay side, we've been trying to coordinate this for everyone through the Youth Council and the Embassy, that at least one objective is fulfilled. It was meant to be four information sessions in webinars, uh, we uh, webinar format to get people to build on the knowledge and understanding they have to question knowledge and understanding that they have, to learn, unlearn, and relearn certain things, understand and accept the community that they are human beings like uh, all of us. They are diff uh, people in, the, in our region, in our countries, in our communities, but they are human beings after all, and they deserve to be treated with respect, uh, with dignity, to live their life in fulfillment and joy and uh, fulfill their dreams. Uh, having said that, as I said, this is the last uh, webinar for 2021 Pride Month, but that is, this is not the end of the conversation. I say this at the end of every uh, webinar. There are still so many questions and so many discussions to be had, and I'm sure for us at the Youth Council, in partnership with the Embassy, we'll endeavor to bring you more such conversations. Keep an eye out on the U.S. Embassy Facebook and Twitter page, uh, I think Instagram also, to see what other sessions the uh, Youth Council uh, brings for you. We have just finished Pride, we'll just be finishing Pride Month. I think we are going to move on to climate change and sustainability. We've, we did mental health last month. So these are the kind of things that the Embassy Youth Council is doing. We are pivoting to a more online advocacy and uh, information session, information sharing roles. Um, with that, uh, 
we have one last thing to do on this call which is if you want to be part of a e selfie